I am super, super, super excited to introduce Stacy Raskin, Bernstein Research. Stacy, how you doing? I'm good, thanks. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Stacy, you know, I, I don't know who gets on CNBC more, you or Daniel. You know, I'm, I'm you or you. I, think, I well, I think I'm available when Stacy's not. You know, like he's <laughs> going to the bathroom or something. They they call me to talk uh, uh, chips on there with Fort. But uh, <laughs> man, it's great to see you. You know, the first time uh, we met, I think, was at a uh, board of directors dinner uh, for a chip company where we were their uh, entertainment. This, this, is, I, this is true, yeah. And I, and, I, and I think they're entertained. But hey, Stacey, let's talk a little bit about kind of what you do, what sure. you don't do. I mean, I know everybody in the chip space knows you, but, you know, we have a pretty broad audience here. Yeah, you, you, you bet. So I'm so again, I'm Stacey Razgon. Um, I'm a managing director and senior analyst at an equity research firm called Bernstein Research, where I look at the U.S. semiconductor and semiconductor capital equipment space. And so what, what, what does that mean, ec equity research? Because you guys are, are tech analysts. Um, I know you talk about companies. You do talk about stocks. Um, so I, I do that as well. Um, there are some other uh, considerations, though. Um, I also explicitly put out ratings and target prices on stocks. I articulate investment conclusions for those stocks, and, and, and I write about those to my, to my clients. Now, that being said, I also do a lot of what you guys do. I, I spend my time immersed in, in the tech supply chain and the semi-supply chain. And my, my background, for those uh, in the audience that don't know, um, I used to be on, on the technical side. So I have a PhD in chemical engineering. I used to build semiconductor manufacturing equipment, uh, plas plasma etchers. My, my PhD thesis is on the plasma etch transfers a roughness down feature sidewalls during semiconductor manufacturing. Um, and I did work at IBM TJ Watson back in the days in their advanced lithography and processes group. Then it, I, I went actually, instead of going directly into the industry, I went into McKinsey instead. And I spent my time at McKinsey uh, doing business consulting for semiconductor companies. And now I'm on Wall Street and I look at semiconductor stocks. So I love it. I love it. So it's, it's fun. I've been doing this 16 years now. This is the longest I've ever been anywhere. And, you know, it, it's, it's yeah. still fun. <laughs> Stacy, thanks for coming on. Uh, you know, question I get, and then we're going to jump into uh, Intel, AMD, yeah. and Qualcomm. Is is how long is your time frame of interest? Is it five years, ten years, yeah. three years? How far yeah. does it go out? Because I, I think that's going to be important for this conversation. <laughs> so theoretically, target prices that I said are supposed to be a twelve month target price. So setting a target price a year. Now, now that being said, in this space, like you, you can't constrain yourself to. Um, I've got, and, and it really depends on my clients. So I have clients who may just care about the next data point, yeah. right? It may just be the next week or the next month or next quarter. I've got clients that have a five-year or 10-year horizon, right? And so you need to be able to sort of dial in and out depending on who you're talking to and have a point of view um, across a variety of, of, of timescales. Um, but in theory, the target prices, you, you got to put a stake in the ground somehow. In theory, that is a 12-month target when, when I do put out uh, target prices and ratings. I love it, man. Yeah, I, I don't tell many people. I actually have a, a finance degree, um, and I was supposed to be in Wall Street, but I picked a, a tech set. So, hey, let's jump in here. So, right, Did you have a real job? I, I Yeah, yeah no. I, the time. I, I used to have a real job, too. Dan loves when I point that out. Because <laughs> I never I, did. Because that's the joke. I don't know, I, Dan. I, you kind of had a real job. Where you were CEO, of a, a distributor. Okay. Hey, let's dive in. We're gonna let's do easiest yeah. first. Yeah. So Qualcomm, yeah. Stacy, you know, big upside in automotive. Um, you know, smartphone mm -hmm. better than maybe yeah. some uh, yeah. expected. So, what were your thoughts on what? What does your note talk about? Yeah. So I mean, so Qualcomm was a, it was a good print, and like so Qualcomm has been an interesting like just stock. Um, you know, it was it was death most of last year as were most of the smartphone names yeah and it wasn't anybody's like fault it wasn't anything that them or frankly any of the other folks in that industry were doing badly it was just smartphones were horrendous <laughs> right they didn't really benefit like like pcs during COVID had a lot of pull forward and for a while we had a lot of demand smartphones we didn't really see that and in fact demand was was worse um i think smartphone shipments were down eight quarters in a row Right, exactly. most of twenty two and twenty three, and and the semiconductors, especially in twenty three, um, there was just too much inventory out there, so they wound up undershipping that low demand. It, it was it was just awful. 
Um, smartphones, however, bottom, you know, like and near the end of last year. And that's actually was, was very good for most of these smartphone names. And uh, they had a really big bounce. Earnings went up and, and the multiples went up and, and the stocks were, were, were pretty good over the last six months. Um, going into this print, people were getting a, a little more nervous. There were some signs, you know, people were worried about Apple shipments and everything else. Qualcomm kind of took their pain last year. They're more exposed to the premium at Android tiers. Yeah. They had some inventory correction last year, which which is kind of bottomed out for them. And so they were able to put up some better numbers, I think, than, than some of the other companies were. The other area where they're really, really benefiting is content. And this is why I'm, I'm actually starting to warm up more to some of those longer term horizon kind of things. Um, I'm getting more bullish on the prospect for AI smartphones. And, and by the way, it there is we go. Now, now, now you're talking my love language, Stacey. <laughs> Hang on, maybe or maybe not. I am not bullish on AI smartphones per se in the sense that I do not believe that anybody is going to run out and buy an AI smartphone where they were not going to buy a smartphone already. I, I am not convinced that it, that it will drive an upgrade cycle yet. However, it should drive content. And this is something where Qualcomm's actually benefited a lot. And in fact, if you look, the whole 5G cycle didn't, didn't drive any kind of upgrade cycle. In fact, smartphones are down... Oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 percent off the peak during the whole 5G cycle. Qualcomm's chipset revenues, however, grew at a 20 percent CAGR. <laughs> yeah. While smartphones were collapsing um, on the back of content increase, as well as some other things you mentioned, auto and everything. But content's gone up a ton. And I actually am getting more and more convinced that at least AI can 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 continue to, those kind of content trends. And I do think when people do buy a smartphone, they will buy an AI smartphone because that is what will be for sale. <laughs> um now, I also think Qualcomm has been doing a lot more on the ecosystem work for, for AI smartphones, whether it's software support, OS support, SDKs, pre-trained models. They've got a whole like website with a ton of pre-trained models that are optimized to run on Qualcomm Silicon. And nobody else in, in the supply chain is, is really doing that, that kind of optimization. So they recognize that there needs to be use cases in killer apps for this. And, and we'll see if that happens or not, but they're doing what they can to try to create that ecosystem within this space is really important. So I'm, I'm starting to really warm up to that thesis. And look, if there is a killer app, maybe Apple comes up with something that everybody has to do. And if it drives an upgrade cycle, like even better, that'd be great. Yeah, we have Google's uh, big conference coming up uh, yeah. next week where they would likely drop something about what they're doing in Android. Mm -hmm. And I think, by the way, all this discussion is 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 very understandable because we haven't seen what Google, what Microsoft, we haven't seen exactly what they're going to be bringing out. We have we have Build coming up in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and we're going to see this. We have WWDC uh, coming up that that should talk about uh, that. So you mentioned Computex. Is, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, forget yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Dan is going to be in Computex. I am not. I'm going to be uh, sweating profusely in Taiwan. Yeah. I, I, I will not. I will not be there, unfortunately. Guys, I will carry the water for you. Congratulations, Dan. You know, again, carry your bags, carry your, anything just to be in this kind of uh, in this circle. Can, can I just hang with you guys? Yeah. So, hey, uh, just, just a final quickie yeah. on Qualcomm. Uh, they have this uh, uh, 45 billion dollar auto backlog. Yes. Uh, definitely. I mean big growth for the quarter, but definitely out of your one year uh, oh, sure. uh, target here. Like, like it, it goes out eight years, I think is, is there, their met. Yes. How, how do you so factor they, that in Stacy? Yeah, you bet. So they've given some medium term as well as longer term targets for revenues. What, what they've said is they think they can do more than more than $4 billion by fiscal year 26, which is actually the out year of my forecast period. Yeah. And more than 9 billion by fiscal year 2030. So those are the targets they've given. They're running right now a little under annualized, a little under two and a half billion. So they're and and, it, and it's growing a lot. So like they're they're kind of on their on that glide path to hit those numbers. And, and what they said was, yeah, they, they the last time they'd given up a pipeline number was thirty billion on a year and a half ago, whenever it was. And now they've taken up to forty five billion. Um, they are not taking those targets up yet, but what they said is we we feel even better about hitting those those targets and and the, right. yeah it, it, it's looking really good so those are i got got a glide path in my numbers for for something that looks like that and, and the real revenue stacy has been pretty impressive too like it's yeah. you know because that's been the thing is like some of these kind of pipeline numbers and then you'll hear like well, why yeah, you never not? know right <laughs> like, but they're, they're they're you're seeing kind of that trajectory of actual revenue that's yeah. showing up in that business that sort of seems like the ramp is 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 calibrated yeah, yeah, you got to remember when they give a people give a pipeline, those are engagements. You never quite know how much of that's going to actually convert into actual orders. 
you don't know over what time frame. I mean, it could be forty-five billion o- over thirty years. Like, like who knows, right? Um, I'll, I'll, it's not gonna be that long. But um, in general, when companies talk about pipelines, they tend to leave those details out. Um, at least Qualcomm is putting up, you know, very reasonable revenue numbers, like uh, along uh, order numbers or, or, or pipeline numbers that look like that. Hey, let's bounce to uh, AMD EPS yeah. revenue. Small little beat outlooks uh, lower than expected. Your headline in your report was not awful, but not awful, as in yeah. full of awe. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, that, was that actually his headline? I, I, yes. I, I, oh, <laughs> nice. All right. Well, well done. <laughs> just wait. Uh, ju- ju- just wait for the Intel one. Yeah, yeah. By, by the way, I should say, like we were talking earlier, t- titles are really important. Like my clients get, you know, like a thousand emails from from folks yeah. like me every single day. You got to give them some reason to click, and so like t- titles are titles are. I spend a lot of time on the titles. Um, yeah, so AMD, um, the, the stock has been tougher recently. You know, although I think year over year it's still pretty good. It had a big ramp up last year in the wake of, frankly, in the wake of Nvidia's. You know, when, when Nvidia kind of blew blew the the doors off the car in in May of last year and really got the whole generative AI cycle going, and AI and AMD, at least from a narrative standpoint, has been benefiting from that. Um, the stock has sold off a bit off the peak, and and it partially because it, it, it's a it's a few reasons. I mean, one was that their core business has not been great, and this is by the way we haven't talked about the broader cycle. Semis, it, it, you know, there was a there's a lot of overhang that they're working off um, from from the COVID years. Um, AMD and and their core business is getting hit by that, and the AI piece for them, as sizable as it is for them, has not been enough to offset some of the weakness in the core business. Plus, I would also argue in the context of the overall AI opportunity from some of the some of their peers like NVIDIA are seeing even, even the multi-billion dollar, dollar numbers that AMD is putting out are, are fairly small in that context. I mean, it's NVIDIA might do $100 billion in data center revenues this year. AMD is guiding for four plus, right? I mean, it, it's not that. Although AMD, to their credit, they don't have to do $100 billion in revenue this year. Um, the issue with AMD stock, and it did sell off, of, off the print, it, it was kind of like inline-ish which the stock is fairly expensive and like in line in that context isn't, isn't always enough. The core business was weak in particular, the, what they call embedded, which is mostly the Xilinx business that they bought a little while back and their gaming business were, were already weak and getting weaker. at some of those cyclical issues. Um, and the AI piece, they, they took it up modestly. They, they, their prior guide had been more than three and a half. Now it's more than four. And so that was kind of like expectations are already there or more. So it just wasn't enough. Now, I will be honest, um, we've been a little more like lukewarm on, on the, the thesis, but I didn't, again, to the, to the title, I didn't think the quarter was all that bad, <laughs> right, in the grand scheme of things. Um, they are still, like, they're, they're core client and data center businesses. They're not super because the markets are not super, but they were not horrible. Right. They're clearly taking share from Intel. We'll probably talk about Intel. Intel had suggested when they reported, you know, a week or so before that they thought they, they held share. They clearly did not hold yes. share. Like, AMD still took share. Um, and and those the, the those the, the the embedded and and, and other weaknesses, presumably that some of it's cyclical. Eventually, that will hopefully come back. And and the AI numbers, they were in line, but I mean it's like they're still growing. Like it's not awful. Um, but right. but like not awful isn't isn't quite enough. Like when when expectations are high, and it's not but, awful. Yeah, this but this is something that that people sometimes get confused when they look at how stocks trade in the wake of earnings, like. And I'll see some sometimes, Pat, even I'll see tweets from you and be like, oh, yeah, the earnings were great and the stock's down a ton. Maybe it's the guidance that was bad. Yeah. Maybe it was the expected, you know, it can be great, but expectations are, are, are much higher. Like the, the real question is how are they performing relative, not to my expectations or my peers' expectations, but my clients' expectations, the folks that are actually doing the, the, the investments themselves. Those expectations are not written down, right? Part of my job, by the way, is to figure out what those expectations actually are. Um, but you can get a good idea of where where they are relative to the numbers, like by observing what happens with the stock when when these guys report. So yeah, I, that, I, that's what happened with them this quarter. I know you might not be able to comment on this, Stacy, but you know yeah. my take on it all is that Nvidia is setting the the expectations of pretty much every data center chip company on the planet right now, and the the comparative is, well, you know, we're expecting Nvidia's. 875 percent growth. I joke, but like on deep. So so Lisa comes out and raises the number. Yeah. You know, three and a half to four, but people were like they wanted her to raise to five. No, or six. No, but you got to remember. So, like last quarter, they raised it from two to three and a half, and the stock yeah. went down. Why? Right. Expectations for AMD going to last quarter was that they would do eight to ten. Right. Right. There was no, no number big enough. 
So they lowered it to three and a half, like the, the, this is the quarter before. That was good because you want to get expectations down. And so they lowered it to three and a half, but people still think they might do five or six. So now they raise it to four, great, but people are still thinking they might do five or six. That's and they're, they've only got two quarters left now. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, yeah, I think that's where I was trying to go was basically yeah. there was no big enough number that she could have said. If she said six, they would have been like, why not eight? I mean, it was yeah. like... And, it, it, remember, they're, they're, you have to remember, they're, they're, they're relatively small. They're, they're, there are other constraints. Like part of the issue for the whole space has been supply constraints, right? I mean, the, these guys are all ramping it up a ton. Remember, they, you don't just snap your fingers and the chips appear, right? You have to make them and you have to put the infrastructure and capacity in place to manufacture them. And that takes time and it's very difficult to kind of gauge. Um, and AMD, because they are smaller, like, you, you know, NVIDIA is pre-buying a lot of this capacity, like like there are they're, they're limits to like how much, like even if AMD, and I, I don't know what they, but even if AMD had demand for $50 billion worth of parts this year, there's no way they could supply anything like that, right? They're probably doing the best they can. And again, it's not bad. Like, I mean, they, this business was zero, you know, just a few quarters ago, like a year ago, right? So, I mean, even to grow it to 4 billion in, in a year from from nothing is is, is not a bad thing necessarily. Yeah, I'm going to end, end on AMD. Uh, in December, I said six billion, and we're going to see we're going to see where that where that ends up. And, yeah. and that was and it's not an insane number. It, it yeah. probably won't be ten this year. Yeah, but you know they, what they said is they'll what AMD said is they will have supply in the back half to to generate upside to that number if the demand is there. It's kind of what they said. That's good. So, so let's pop to Intel. So yeah. Intel. Uh, Big EPS beat for the quarter, improved gross margins, yeah. lower than expected top line, and a lower forecast. He's crazy. Yeah. JC, uh, your He's note crazy. was, quote unquote, hello, darkness, my friend. I've come to talk with you again. <laughs> yeah, they're 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 in a they're in a tough spot, right? They, they know it. There's there there. Look, I, what I I've, I've said prior is this was always going to happen. It, it took ten years to break it. Like it's going to take yeah. ten years to fix it. And you know, Intel had a foundry, you know, they, they did this. There's, there's a few things that are going on with Intel. One is just their, their, their numbers have been bad. They, they just have, I mean, it, it is, it is what it is. Again, the, we can talk about some of the dynamics that the PC market has not been great. Um, there was a lot of channel impact like during COVID. They were over shipping. You had a massive inventory correction. I think they've actually been, been over shipping again the last couple of quarters. Both. So, so that, that is impact for the, the forward trajectory of their client business. Plus they're losing share in, in, in servers. Plus traditional data center, you know, in the wake of all the AI strength, traditional data center has been quite weak. Server chips and networking and that sense. So that's been impacting them. They're impacted on their Altera business, the same issues with AMD's embedded business, like that, that's very weak. So they've got like like issues just in general, near-term cyclical issues in their business, longer-term potential structural issues around like share losses to AMD, and then now maybe, you know, AI and accelerators taking share from traditional data centers. They don't have anywhere near the the AI or accelerator story that some of their peers do. So you don't have that. And now they have this this foundry business that they're trying to build. They're investing a ton of money. Um, they don't that they don't really have, <laughs> right? Um, they're burning cash, right? They did a foundry day uh, a few weeks ago where they kind of like showed us the economics of the two businesses, the product piece of the company, the foundry business. The foundry business economics are, I think, unsurprisingly horrendous. They lost a billion that year, last year, which was not surprising. What I found surprising was the foundry losses are going to get even worse this year. That's in the wake of them potentially, supposedly they cut $3 billion in costs last year and presumably their revenues are getting better. So what it tells you is there's some real structural issues. Um, my biggest takeaway from the foundry day was come back in 2030. I mean, again, they gave some medium term and longer term models for margins and numbers, which I still think look aggressive personally. And even if you believe them, they basically said this is going to look like like a horror show for the next like three, four, five years at least. Like like so, even if you believe in that long term, and and I can construct a bull case if you wanted to, for what that long term could look like. But I mean, it it it's a long ways out. There's there it, it's hard, right? This is why the stock has been selling off. And then we you know we had the Huawei news like the other day, <laughs> right? Yeah, Where, we're gonna we're, we're gonna dive into that. So, Stacy, what would yeah. you have to see from Foundry and when? Well, uh the to, to 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 for it to make a change i mean you want to see volumes right again they've, they've announced customers and engagements which is fine but again by their own day they, they showed their own forecasts like i mean they're not expecting any sort of material revenues till like the latter half of the decade yeah in foundry and and it's still an open question like how am i i but i don't doubt that they've got a ton of engagements 
I think anybody that's looking for, for, for leading edge process technology is going to be looking at them. Why wouldn't you? Like everybody wants second sources. The whole like geopolitical question and like how sustainable is having the world's leading edge manufacturing in Taiwan, that is a real a real worry. Right. I understand all of this, but I mean, these are not problems that like you can't just throw money at these problems and fix them. Well, they're long term. I mean, the tech, the tech the tech has to be there. But, hey, Stacy, it's going to yeah. be uh, getting uh, uh, advanced EUV machines. Uh, that's what it's all about. Didn't you? Didn't you read that? Read the memo? Yeah, yeah, the high NA. I mean, that has exactly. a whole, that has a whole other set of issues that we could talk about. Now, but I will say, like back in the days when Intel was actually at the forefront of of new innovations, they were actually doing better. So you can think. Of, they were the first ones to do like silicon germanium and the first ones to do high K metal gate, the first ones to do fin fats, right? And and those were, were they were phenomenal for them, right? I you and you can make the argument that when they stopped, like when part of their big issue, you know, when they have the, the problems going to 10 nanometers, and is they they didn't want to use EUV. They decided they could do it using multiple patterning, and as it turns out, they were wrong. In the meantime, TSMC like aggressively went after EUV and and, and you know how this works, it's a learning curve. Right? BK, BK to the end. Uh, right. was saying that EUV didn't work um, and it, TSMC got it to work. So Stacy, yeah. let's bounce, uh, let's bounce yeah. and Dan. We'll, to, we'll, see, we'll yeah. see what high NA does, does for that. Yeah, so there, there are other issues with high NA. As we move yeah. into that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But I mean, again, call, call me in a few years. I mean, it's, it's going to be a slog and I think it was always going to be a slog. Yeah, as we move into the, uh, the 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 back end of this and get into our topics yeah. of the week. By the way, thanks, Stacy, for giving us the rundown. Pat and I did yeah. this last week, so everybody out there want to check out our comments compared to Stacy's, and then send Pat and I a note and let us know how great we did or how great <laughs> we didn't do. But the uh, the the one thing I say is I talked to Bloomberg this week about Intel, and, and they basically asked me the question like, yeah. in the near term, is there any reason to invest? Boy, was that a hard question to answer yeah. because I think what you said was exactly what I said: is there is a really kind of compelling long tail. But the short tail is really hard. It's if you're it, it, yeah. yeah. So it goes back to your question on on what's your horizon, right? I mean, it depends. You know, and, and look, I mean, the the book value is on a twenty seven bucks a share. It's not that far off of there, right? I mean, yeah. they're I mean, they're burning book value, they're burning cash. Although they're getting subsidies, and again, I can argue the geopolitical benefits. And you know, but it, it's a, it's going to be a, it's probably going to be a slog. Yeah, so, I am. Uh, I'm interested. I'm I'm interested to see uh, when we have a TSMC uh, created. Uh, compute tile, so it's kind of mono e mono with with AMD. Now, on the cost side, that that isn't good, but on the competitive side and getting back market share, yeah, I see that as maybe. positive. And by the way, the company has moved from a completely monolithic design to distributed, and theoretically, that means your net but, good die per wafer. You're doing the wrong thing. Like, like yeah. what, what is what is Pat's alternative? It's, it's to lay down and die. It, it, I, exactly. And some people are like. Oh, they need new leadership, or they need to split. He, it's he's like not exactly what he said. He was, I think his biggest yeah. error was was how he said expectations. So he came in and he was like really a cheerleader. He said everything's fixed and it's going to be great. They had an analyst day in twenty two where they put out targets that were like outlandish. Were, but they, you also have to remember, like investors, we're not the only audience for what he says, right? It's also the U.S. government and its employees and its customers and its suppliers, and like you have to keep. You got to keep the boat from totally sinking, even though there's a hole in it, right? I mean, you, you just he, he has to, you know, ma maintain all of that. Like so, so the the investors themselves are not the only audience for for the messaging. But I mean, at some point you've got to put up or shut up, and like we're we're at that point now where like yeah. everything is now starting to hit him. I think it was always going to be like this, personally. Right. Um, right. We're we're just at that point now. We just they're going to have to get through. It's going to be a while.